A brief overview of Deutero-Isaiah, chapters 49 and 50, in August of 2023. Learning objectives for this session include the following. To outline the passage, to identify three voices who speak, to identify who is my servant Israel, to explain Hebrew verb tenses in poetry, and then to find variants in ancient manuscripts, to classify stages of fulfilled prophecy. The structure of chapter 49, for purposes of discussion, can be viewed as Yahweh conversing with his servant about his origins, his task, his reward, and then Yahweh conversing with his people about their return to Judea, about their expansion, and about their oppressors. Yahweh's Servant's Origins Yahweh called me before I was born, while I was in my mother's womb, he named me. And he said to me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Surely my cause is with Yahweh, and my reward with my God. The Servant, a title of honor in Isaiah. First, this servant is seen to be humble in his birth and growth. He will eventually suffer and will die, as we shall find in later chapters. He gives his life as a sacrifice for others. He was buried, risen, and prolonged his days. He draws Gentiles from all nations. He will rule the world with power and serves as a covenant between God and humanity. This summary from J.B. Payne, Encyclopedia of Prophecy. And now Yahweh says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Something about verbs in Hebrew poetry. First, verbs have neither tense nor time. Time, if any, must be inferred from context and you have great latitude in employing English verb tenses in your translation. One verb usually has another verb in parallel, each one modifying or limiting the meaning of the other. Verb choices are sometimes archaic, unusual, or foreign, to please or surprise hearers. Poetry can recall an idea from a distant or separate book or context. Just as the king of Burma sent an embassy to the viceroy of India, servants of great leaders are themselves very privileged, of high rank, and can control great wealth. Thus saith Yahweh, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the slave or servant of rulers, kings shall see and stand up, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of Yahweh who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. The Holy One in this verse is Yahweh. The slave of rulers, however, this is the same term used of servant. This is not a, a lowly position, but an exalted one. Now, there are several types of fulfilled prophecy found in the Bible. There are occasions of predictions and detailed fulfillments, such as 
the 490-year prediction made by Daniel. There are some end-time scenarios that have been partly fulfilled, such as the arrival of Messiah. Other end-time scenarios not yet fulfilled at all, such as a worldwide messianic reign or government. Sometimes there are timeless promises fulfilled at any time and repeatedly, such as blessing for Gentile nations. There are figurative types and antitypes. Israel being called out of Egypt is applied in the New Testament to Jesus as an antitype. Sometimes past events have later analogies, such as the child born to a virgin in the king's palace of Judea, serving as an analogy to the later birth of the Messiah to a literal virgin. And then detailed description with a singular historical fulfillment. For example, the rise of King Cyrus and his capture of the city of Babylon. Yahweh's people's return to Judea. Some shall come from far away, some from the north and some from the west, and some from the land of Siren. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exalt, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing, for Yahweh has comforted his people and will have compassion on his suffering ones. Where was the land of Siren? The Masoretic text reads, the land of Sinim, Hebrew text. A Dead Sea Scroll translation of this passage reads, The people of Sien. The Greek Septuagint, translated in the 3rd century BCE, reads, The land of the Persians. The Latin and Syriac versions, The land of the south. In the 19th century, there was a tendency to interpret the word sinim in the Masoretic text as a reference to the land of the Chinese. We now understand that Sien is modern Aswan region of Egypt, which at the time was an ancient Persian military colony and could be taken as the southern limit of the civilized world. Yahweh's people's expansion. Your builders outdo your destroyers. Lift up your eyes all around you and see. They all gather. They come to you. Now you will be too crowded for your inhabitants. I am Yahweh. Those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. This very small straggling Contingent returning to Judea will once again be numerous. What is meant by your builders? The Masoretic texts, Greek versions, the Syriac, Aramaic Targums read, Your sons outdo your destroyers. Dead Sea Scrolls, the Greek Septuagint, and the later Latin version read, Your builders outdo your destroyers, that is, you are building new cities faster than anyone can destroy them. Exiled and put away. Then you will say in your heart, Who has borne me these? I was bereaved and barren, exiled and put away, or divorced. Masoretic text and most other versions read, I was exiled and removed. Dead Sea Scrolls read, I was exiled, removing. The Greek Septuagint leaves out both words. Jewish populations have experienced remarkable growth in some countries at different periods, sometimes suffering evil, crushing, destructive, and murderous pogroms. Yahweh's people's oppressors. The captives of the mighty will be taken and the prey of the tyrant will be rescued, for I will contend with those who contend with you, and I will save your children. 
I will make your oppressors eat their own flesh, that is, their own children. I am Yahweh, your Savior, and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. So, who is this servant Israel? There are various theories that commentators and preachers have adopted. Some say, well, was this Cyrus the Great? Or national Israel? Or ethnic Israel? Some righteous remnant of Israel? Or end-time Israel, yet to be fulfilled? Or a particular king of Israel? Or was this one of the Israelite prophets, perhaps Isaiah himself? Or a future Messiah who could be called Israel or the king of Israel? Coming to chapter 50, the structure, we shall lay out a structure again for purposes of discussion about Yahweh's past actions. And then Yahweh's servant speaks. He tells how he learns from Yahweh, how he depends upon Yahweh, and then finally Isaiah speaks. He speaks to the faithful, and then he speaks to the wicked. Yahweh's people's past. Where is your mother's bill of a divorce with which I dismissed her? It was because of your sins that you were sold and for your transgressions your mother was dismissed. However, Yahweh says, I never divorced her. I was disciplining you, her children. Or have I no strength to deliver? Hey, it was by my rebuke that I dried up the reed sea over which you crossed, leaving Egypt. I can do this again. And then Yahweh's servant learns, The Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, has given me a trained tongue that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. As the New Testament affirms, Messiah learned obedience through what he suffered. Think of it. Until then, God himself had never suffered. And then Yahweh's servant trusts. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. He who vindicates me is near, or otherwise put, is here with me. So who will contend with me? It is Yahweh Elohim who helps me, who will declare me guilty. Risen from death, he is declared righteous. Isaiah speaks to the righteous. Who among you fears Yahweh and obeys the voice of his servant? Who walks in darkness and has no light, yet trusts in the name of Yahweh and relies upon his God? Is it not you? Finally, Isaiah speaks to the wicked. But all of you are kindlers of fire, lighters of firebrand, seeking to destroy my people. So, walk in the flame of your fire and amongst the brands that you have kindled. This is what you shall have from my hand. You shall lie down in torment. The second death. The phrase, walk in the flame of fire, however, in the Masoretic Hebrew text, the Dead Sea Scrolls Hebrew text, and the Aramaic Targums read, walk in the flame of your fire. In fire is pronounced be'ur. The Greek Septuagint, the Latin, and Syriac translations read, walk in the light of your fire. In light reads Be'or. The difference is Be'or and Be'or. Which did Isaiah first write? Note that until the 10th century CE, 
All Hebrew texts had few or no vowels, hence these occasional translation differences.